Welcome to Series 3, Episode 2 of the In Her Financial Shoes podcast. Welcome to the In Her Financial Shoes podcast with me, Catherine Morgan, founder of The Money Panel, helping you to get financially naked. Listen in each week where we talk about that taboo subject of money. Listen to brutally real life stories, step into our guest shoes and be left feeling 100% confident and in control. Oh, and we hate financial jargon, so don't expect any here. Small steps, big wins, let's go. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Now, in today's episode, we're going to be continuing our journey with Lisa Johnson. If you haven't listened to part one of Lisa Johnson's interview, then please do go back and listen to episode one of series two from last week. And in that particular episode, we did a really deep dive into Lisa's personal journey in terms of how she managed through a whole heap of um, challenges growing up with being bullied at school and how that impacted on how she brings her children up and also how it impacted on her career, which then led her into building a very successful six-figure coaching business. So in this particular episode, we're going to do a deep dive into Lisa's business, understanding the real raw reality, I guess, of running a coaching business, some of the challenges that she's faced, some of the top tips that she's going to leave you with as well in terms of how to build passive income for you in your own business. So do grab a pen and paper. This is a really great episode and I hope you enjoy. Hi again, Lisa, and thank you so much for joining us again on the In Her Financial Shoes podcast for the next episode. And this is where we're going to do a really deep dive into your, you know, how you've tra- completely transformed your life and are now very well known to be the passive income queen. And quite rightly so, you deserve that title. Oh. Um, so, Lisa, you, you know, you are a very straight talking coach for entrepreneurs and what I'd really like to understand in this particular episode is to share some of your, some of the wins, some of your tips, some of the challenges as well of building an income that's based around passive income and also explore this concept of exactly what passive income is, because I think it's hugely misunderstood. It is. <laughs> and that's really where I want to start. So what, what exactly from your um, point of view, Lisa, what exactly is passive income? Yeah. So passive income is not trading time for money. So it's not passive in the sense that you just go to sleep and money will appear. It's passive in the sense that you don't have to be in the room to make the money. You don't have to be anywhere to make money. You can be asleep and you'll make the money. But passive income is where you have an asset up front that you've created, and then you make money from it time and time again. So a really easy example that I always speak about of this is having a spare room. If you have a spare room and you've bought the room, you've painted the room, you've put a bed in the room, you've made it look nice, you've got the asset, you've done the work up front, and then a lodger can stay in that room and pay you every month and you're not actually having to do anything else. You don't need to be there, you don't need to do any more work, the money just comes in. But you still had to do something at the beginning. And that's what passive and semi-passive is is even more so, most of my income streams are semi-passive rather than passive, it means I have to do some, some work as I go along. So if you take, like courses are a great example of passive and semi-passive income. So let's say that you have a course, so I have a course that I've created, and I, it's a 10-month course. It's been done five or six times, so all the PowerPoints are written, all the, you know, the workbooks are written, they're all there, the work has been done up front, the asset is there. I then have to go in, because I like to teach it live, so I go in once a month for one hour and deliver the training. So over 10 months, I have to do 10 hours work. So that's, that's not passive, I'm doing 10 hours work, it's semi-passive. However, I will make 200,000 from those 10 hours. So when you think about if you were doing one-to-one work, you wouldn't make that much money from 10 hours. That's where the difference is. It's going from one-to-one to 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 one-to-many and then becoming semi-passive. So I have another course that is completely passive, which basically means someone can just buy it at any time. They go off and do it on their own. I don't do it live and I make the money. So in that sense, it's completely passive. I will wake up in the morning and it will be there, you know, the money will be there and I'm not having to do anything. However, 
even with all of that, you still have to market. You know, yeah, you still have to market those things. Yeah. And it might mean that you market it along with other things. So it might mean that if you're growing your list, for example, you have a page at the end of your, your email sequence where you sell that passive income product. So if you're going to do that anyway, you may as well have some passive income on there and make some money from it while growing your list. So it might be something you were going to do anyway, but you still in some way have to market it. And for me, I love a launch. So that's how I market most of mine. And so how did you first come uh, across the concept of passive income? So I'd, going back a little bit, my uh, kind of path to get to being an entrepreneur, I was working in investment banking and was supposed to feel quite lucky about that because, you know, I'd got to that point having grown up with, with not much money, but I was working 80 hour weeks. And then I got pregnant unexpectedly with twins. And so there was no way that was going to carry on. I mean, I did think it would carry on. I had no clue. So I, you know, <laughs> you don't, before you've had you, you just don't have any clue about how it's going to change you. So mm-hmm. I went back to work at when they were five months old and never saw them and realized that couldn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead I got a really easy nine to five job near my house. Um, so I could put them to bed and see them in the morning, but I was bald stiff. And so I thought, oh, I know I'll start a business. I've always thought, you know, it'd be nice to start a business. I didn't really know anything about business. Started a business as a wedding planner. And um, that led to, that went badly for a year. Um, and I was earning barely anything, doing lots and lots of work and not really earning very much for it. And then I got a business coach learned the real foundations of stuff that I really should have learned beforehand, changed everything around. And and it was a very successful business. And so then other people started asking me to teach them what happened. Um, What kind of uh, foundations lessons did you learn when you were growing that wedding business? Things. Well, the biggest lesson was you can't serve everybody. Like you have an ideal client, you have somebody that you need to be talking to all the time, not everybody. And I was trying to, you know, talk to everybody. I also had an accidental brand. So I hadn't branded myself with any kind of messaging, with anything that said, this is who I am. This is what I want to help. This is what I'm good at. I just hadn't done any of that. So I was getting, you know, budget brides and all sorts of people. Um, Once I got that messaging out, it changed things. I did the money mindset work at the same time that we talked about last week. And, you know, it made a big difference on, and, and just things like having a marketing plan, you know, strategy stuff I didn't know about, um, how to network, how to sell, all of these things. Um, and so then I realized that I had a bit of an aptitude for breaking down these kind of jargon, if you like, in business into really easy step by step, do this and it'll work kind of thing. Um, and so people started hiring me to do that, not just from the wedding industry, from all walks of life. Um, and so then I realized actually that was a business that I could truly love. And, and I did, I, it was absolutely became my passion, but again, I I pivoted a year in, I was doing really well. I'd gone in a year, I'd got to like six, multi six figures actually in the first year. But I, and everyone said, you're so successful because surely if you're fully booked, you're successful. Mm. I feel successful. I'd given up a nine to five by this point to work from six in the morning until midnight. (laughs) Didn't seem very successful to me. This life plan I had of traveling and of of spending time with the kids wasn't happening. And so I was like, there's something here that I'm doing wrong. And then I heard a debate on passive income where somebody was talking to somebody else about it, saying it was a myth. And that passive income doesn't exist and we need to stop talking about it. If anyone ever says anything like that, I'm interested straight away. (laughs) It normally means that person isn't doing it, but somebody else is doing it really successfully. Mm -hmm. So I went and I spent over 100,000, I think it was 150,000 on coaching and courses to do with passive income, to like just immerse myself in it. And then started implementing the things I'd learned, giving myself a few passive income streams. And it worked. And suddenly I was 90% earning 90% of my money from passive and semi-passive income streams and not doing any one-to-one anymore. Mm. And so I had all this time and all this freedom to travel and nothing was holding me back anymore. So that's kind of how I got into it. And then it was, I think it was only a year ago. I mean, I've only been a coach for two years, just over two years. So I'm not like somebody that's been coaching for years and years and years. Um, And I think it was just last year. I was on a sunbed in Dubai and somebody wrote to me and said, 
you've just put a statement on showing that you've earned 200,000 in the last 10 to 12 weeks. How have you been doing that? Because I've been watching your Instagram and you've been on holiday the whole time. And then I realized that people didn't know how to do this stuff. And so I started teaching passive income and then other people started making semi-passive and passive income and the rest is history. Kind of thing. And that's how you become where you are today. Yeah, exactly that. What on earth made you go into a wedding business? I'm really interested. It sounded glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it might be fun and that I just get to, I like parties and I like to organize parties and it sounded like it would be a bit like that. And there's cake involved. Who doesn't want to do something cake involved? <laughs> it sounded really like it would be a laugh. Um, and so I went into it really for the wrong reasons. I did enjoy it, but it was never a passion. I saw a gap in the market for, I, when I was getting married, I wanted an urban, cool, dark wedding. I didn't want pastel. I didn't want chair covers. I didn't want a chocolate fountain. I wanted something really us, really cool, and um, couldn't find it. So when I became a wedding planner, I wanted to fill that gap and do warehouse weddings, urban weddings. And that's what we did. And that's eventually why it became successful. Because once we started putting that message out, mm. we're urban, we're not for everybody, we're just for you. Um, it worked and all the people you know we got rid of 95 percent of the population because they did want a very pretty wedding but five percent of people just wanted a sort of anti-wedding if you like and they came to us and we only needed that many you know to who had big budgets and let's talk about that because so many people are afraid to niche you know we all hear this you need to have a niche market but it is so important right because the, the biggest fear for a lot of business owners is that if they niche they the fear there is that well i'm going to lose all of these potential yeah. clients that are going to pay yeah. me and words like pigeonholing come into play and people are like really worried that if they niche too much then their clients, you know, they won't get any clients then. It's even less people. But the thing is, if you think of it like if you walk into a, if you have a really bad toothache and you walk into a chemist and there are like five bottles on the shelf and four of them say gets rid of pain relief fast. And one says gets rid of toothache within three minutes and that one costs £10 more than the others, you're still going to buy it mm. because it's the exact solution for you. So if there are five business coaches and one is a business coach, particularly for mums who want to work in the creative industry, you're going to go for that person if that's who you are. So it's much, much better to niche because then you'll, you'll get your people. And, you know, I've, I, I teach a lot of people to have memberships now that are very niched and, and courses. And some of them are so, so niche that you would think there can't possibly be enough people. But there are millions of people in the world. You know, there's always people to fill anything that you want to. Yeah, and I think, I think that, that would be certainly one piece of advice I would give to any business owner that's starting their business is to, is to just go niche. And even if it's the niche that you may not eventually end up with just that niche, but just get started with it. You can massively change. Just know who you're talking to. And I mean, mm. have this one person in your head. Give them a name if you need to, but know everything about them. I kind of think when I started, because I learned that in the wedding business, when I started coaching, it went much quicker and I got money much quicker from it because I knew who I was talking to. So I could talk to just that person. Like at that point, I was just trying to attract people because when I was looking for a coach, like a year before that, I couldn't find a coach that didn't have at least 30% woo woo in their content. So, you know, they'd talk about law of attraction and, and the asking the universe and all this kind of stuff. And I knew I didn't want that. I wanted like 100% strategy and I couldn't find a single person. In the end, I went with a coach that had 10, 10 or 20% woo-woo because I had to because there was nobody else out there. And so I knew when I started, I wanted to only talk to people who didn't want that. And lots of people, coaches said to me, I wouldn't do that if I were you because mm -hmm. people like the woo-woo stuff. And if you do that, you're cutting off so many people. But I knew that by doing it, those 5% that really were sick of listening to the woo-woo stuff and had probably paid coaches before and not made money um, would come to me. And that's exactly what happened. And then it doesn't mean I had to do that forever. Once I pivoted and only wanted to teach passive income and, you know, starting businesses quickly and growing businesses quickly, I just dropped that and gave myself a new message. 
Yeah, fabulous. How did you go about choosing a business coach? Because I think that when you said before about you invested over £100,000 in courses and mentors and coaches, how did you start that journey of actually choosing who was the right coach for you? I, I think it's really hard and I've made big mistakes. So it's not, I'm not saying that I've always chosen well. I've paid £30,000 to a business coach that I learned not even one single thing from. And you don't always know. And I, I've... I've learned to do due diligence a lot better now. So how I used to choose was just to kind of look on their website, see if there was somebody that would already been through what, where I wanted to get to. So if they've already been through it, they can teach me the lessons they learned. And that's always why I wanted to coach. I also, I need accountability. I'll go and watch Netflix all day if I don't have accountability. <laughs> I needed somebody to do that. And so I went from websites and I went from online testimonials. After my experience with a really bad coach, I will never do that again. So now I'm much, much cleverer. I won't go on a testimonial. I will want to speak to the person mm. that has worked with them because I've given testimonials to people because I've felt forced to right. and I've enjoyed working with them. So then I'm like, okay, so, you know, let, I'll speak to people. And I've done that. And I've, I've said, can I speak to these people that you have on your website? And I've spoken to them. They've said, don't work with them. Right. You know, I felt I had to do that. And I think that happens a lot. Um, yeah. I've mean, talked about bullying before on the online industry, but I think that very strong coaches can bully people because people are scared of what they can do to their business. They can bully them into giving them testimonials. So I never do that now. I'm really good with due diligence. And now I will, I, I don't just go for somebody because of what they've earned anymore or where they are or like how, you know, kind of like coachy famous they are because I think that's all a load of crap. I go for somebody that, behind the scenes has it more sorted. They've got systems in place. I want a sustainable long-term business and that's what I want to teach my clients to have. Not a quick flash in the pan, make a few hundred K and then you disappear. Yeah. That longevity for me. Lisa, are you happy to share with who your current coach is? Your current mentor? Yeah, I coach with lots of different people now. So um, what I realized is that I'm much better choosing coaches that have a specialism of the thing I need. So for instance, sales coach, I sometimes work with Jessica Lorimer because she's great at like the sales kind of stuff. I have a launch coach when I'm launching and that's uh, Jade Gemma. She's really, really cool as well. I have a mastermind that I'm in with Selena Sue in the US just because it's, I feel like in the US there's a different mentality around money. And they're not so afraid to talk about money. And because my one of my biggest goals is to earn money. So in the UK, when we talk about money, I get a lot of slack online about it. In the US, when I talk about money, they're like, yeah. You normal. Know, yeah. Really normal. And so I feel more comfortable in groups, especially in a mastermind, in groups of people that are earning sort of seven, multi-seven figures, because I can be myself over there a lot more. And so I've loved being in Selena Sue's mastermind. It's coming to an end in the next month and I'll be really sad to see it go. Um, but I coach with lots of different people for different things. And I always will now, instead of having one coach that does everything, because I don't think one coach knows everything and, and nor should they, you know, if I want media, I'm going to be around, you know, Celine de Costa or Selena Sue. If I want something to do with sales I'm going to go to a sales coach if I I'm, I also work with a really really cool mindset coach called Shari she's brilliant because I need mindset help all the time but especially because the kind of thing I, I do I'm a target because I'm a bit marmite online and because of that it can kind of it can really mess with your energy mm. and um, having somebody that I can talk over those things with really helps me and, and I love the fact that that you've got different coaches for different things and I often talk to 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 podcast listeners about certainly relationships like I think you know you can't we can't expect our partners for example to provide support in our life and business and kids yeah. and everything on them <laughs> exactly so we need to have like this network of of people that we can go to to support us in our relationships mm -hmm. you know when we want to slag our husbands off or whatever we got yeah. this and we can talk to you about that if, you know maybe that's the wrong thing to say but <laughs> keep it real, right but keeping it real yeah, and it's um, about having that network because the problem is if you expect everything from one person, you're very likely to be disappointed, first of all, anyway. But also, 
the reason we have, I think there's a lack mentality around coaching in the UK. Whereas if somebody coaches with somebody else, yeah, we all talk community over competition, but there's a lot of people that talk community over competition and they only mean it until the competition comes along. Yeah. And I've really seen this lack mentality of people like, oh, you know, you poached my clients or um, this client has now gone to work with you and therefore I'm angry. And that's because they're worried they won't get the money from that client and therefore that money is gone. When in reality, if we're all using people for different things, uh, there's never any competition, never any. So, you know, people will come to me to learn how to launch. They'll come to me to learn how to make money quickly. They'll come to me for passive income. In true honesty, no one's going to come to me to learn mindset. Hmm. You know, that's not my bag. I do teach mindset, but if I'm honest, if somebody comes to me and wants to learn mindset, I'm going I'm to send it to them. somebody time. else. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. the people it's, out there that are brilliant with mindset. It's sticking in your lane, isn't it? Sticking in your lane, sticking in okay. what you're good at, what you want to be doing as well. Because sometimes as a business owner, we think we, we get these big shiny objects that come up, don't we? And we're like, yeah. oh, this, this, this client wants to pay me money to go and do this. But actually, is it going to give you the lifestyle that you want? No. And once you start turning down clients, that's when you realize you're a true business owner. You're yeah. an entrepreneur. Because you don't have to take everybody on. As soon as you don't have that lack mentality anymore, you will make money from the thing that you love doing. Um, you know, profit follows passion always. So if you start doing things you're not passionate about, you the money will slow down anyway because you won't love doing it. You'll, you'll hate having a business, but also you won't be very good at it. And then yeah, in this, in, in this world, people talk very quickly. So you need to do things that you're good at. Yeah. And you're passionate about, I love that. I love that phrase. Passion before profit. It's, passion follows, passion follows, passion follows, profit. follows passion. <laughs> follows passion. Yeah. And it really does. Like I've done things before that I haven't loved doing. I used to do a lot of one-to-one work, um, for like a day or three months. Now I only do that one one or two people every six months because I like keeping my hand in I like talking to people but if I've got 10 or 15 one-to-ones I, I don't enjoy it mm. I enjoy group work more yeah lovely and actually if it's okay with you Lisa I've got a couple of questions that came in from my uh, Facebook community about everything that we're just talking about here around mm-hmm. passive income and that there's a real common thread with this there's the one of the questions that came in was around um, how how to align passive income with a service based business, and yeah. I went on to ask what was her business, and she said that she's a social worker, um, and they're looking at outsourcing courses. And the kind of conversation thread went down around, well, actually, I'm not sure that people would pay for an online course or a membership. And one of the things that 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 really resonated with me there was about understanding what your client wants before you launch. Definitely, that's a big part of. You know, if you're looking to invest loads of your time and effort into building an asset, like you just described, recording webinars, building workbooks, there's no point in doing all of that unless you know what your audience needs. And there's two things there, or maybe three things there. The first is, I actually don't write a word of any course at all or membership until I've sold it. Mm -hmm. You know, this information that you have, that your knowledge about, it's in your head. It's not going to take you long to get it down or to video it. Um, And you can give yourself time by saying that you're going to drip feed the course every two weeks or three weeks if you need to, so that you, the first time, you can write it as you go along. But don't, I've seen people take six months making these lovely shiny courses and they haven't asked their audience whether they want it and then it doesn't sell. So it's much better to, to, to not do it that way. But secondly, there's a system. So I've developed a system called the cash system. So two S's in, I wish it could have one, but it just doesn't work. Um, and this cash system is, I realized that I was doing the same thing over and over again to make passive and semi-passive income. And that the way I was teaching my clients was the same all the time. So I developed a system and trademarked it and how that goes, I'll talk to you a bit about how that goes because it covers what you just talked about. So the C is client. First of all, before you even know if you want to do a membership or a group program or workshop or whatever, know who you want to help. Who do you want to serve? It might not be who you think. So lots of people think that it has to be about their business. So, you know, well, I teach LinkedIn. I'm a LinkedIn specialist, so I have to do a course in LinkedIn. What about if you also go to the theater? 
So you might want to do a membership on for people that go to the theatre. It could be a hobby. It doesn't have to always be your business. It could be something you used to do in a call centre, customer service, for instance, that you now want to bring into a course or a membership. There's loads of things you can do. So like, you need to open your mind a little bit about who you want to serve. Then A is the audience. And that means growing an audience and nurturing an audience. There are a lot of coaches out there right now telling people that they can sell courses and they don't need an audience. You need an audience. I guarantee that if you do a course where they're telling you you don't need an audience, you are going to be disappointed by the end. So grow an audience of those people that you identified who were your ideal clients and nurture them, just serve them, just give value. And then the S is about systems and structures. So know where you want to do it, how you want to do it. There's so many brilliant places where you can host courses right now and memberships. And some are standalone. Some are just plugins on your websites. That's even easier. Mine is. It's member space. It's like a plugin on my Squarespace website. It's like £40 a month or something. Um, there are really easy ways to do things. But also know how you want to deliver. Not everybody wants to be on video. Some people might just like to do an email course. Some people might like to do MP3s or PDFs. There's a million different ways that you can actually put stuff out there now. And then the, the next S is about selling, which is launching. The biggest problem I see is people having an audience and then going, right, I've made a course. I'm going to sell this course. I have a course. And then no one buys it. <laughs> and a launch strategy is as important as the strategy for your overall business. It should take six to 12 weeks to launch something mm -hmm. and you should do it properly. And there are many different ways of doing it. Um, and so like launch planning is one of my favorite things to do. <clears throat> Launching really doesn't have to be stressful. People always say, oh, it's so stressful. Launch. Just come out of a launch and now I need to lie down for a week. Why <laughs> launch on holiday? You don't have to have a stressful launch. You can launch from a sunbed. It's all about the preparation beforehand. And then the H is retention, like how to keep people happy. It's about retention. Because if you have a membership, you want to keep the people in there happy. If you have a course or a workshop, you want to remarket it, have a waiting list, remarket it so that people, for instance, the next time I open Passion for Passive, there's already a waiting list of people there. So it's an easier launch, if you like. Um, and I think if you get all of those parts right, you will always make passive income. And I've had many clients do my course, Passion for Passive, who've done that. And the biggest bit, the bit that takes the time, the bit that most people give up on is growing the audience. Mm. So, it, and actually that's a, you've probably answered the, the second question which came in, which was how to get started. Yeah. The, I think what you just said you there. Really grow an audience. Yeah. And it's hard to do. And um, for the first, you could do this anywhere. I like Facebook groups. I think they work really well still. I know people are very down on Facebook at the moment, but it's still a free platform essentially where you can grow an audience. So I use Facebook groups. Some people use Instagram, some people use LinkedIn. Um, or, or just their list, you know, if they don't want to be visible in that way, you can just grow your list and have an audience there. Um, I have a little list and I have a group and I always have had. And the first time I grew a Facebook group, I had no money. So I couldn't put lots of money into Facebook ads or anything like that. I had to grow it organically. And I did. It just took more time. So it took me about five months to grow an audience of around 1,200 people. And then I sold to them and did a 60,000 pound launch. So it was worth that time of, you know, helping out in other people's Facebook groups, um, being really visible on your own Facebook group and your own Facebook page like daily, just, mm. you know, you have to put a lot into it at the beginning, having a sales funnel to drive people in there easier, all of the things we, we know to do, go and talk in other people's memberships. Go and talk in other people's Facebook groups. Be available and show up. <clears throat> and then yeah. the second time, I really didn't want to wait that long to grow an audience and sell. So I put Facebook ads into it. Um, I spent about 6,000 on Facebook ads over three months to make the exact same size audience, about 1,500. And then I did a 100,000 pound launch. So wow. six great ads for 100,000 works okay. And it was a lot easier. So Facebook ads have their place. But... At the beginning, when you're just starting to make passive income, you don't know your conversion rates. You don't know how many people you have to have in a group to convert. And no one can tell you because everybody's different. Some people convert, the, app, the industry standard is 1% to 3%, but you know I'm 11%. I have clients who are 14% conversion rates, which just means how many people are actually going to buy from you from your audience. Mm. So 
before you know that, I wouldn't be chucking loads of money into Facebook groups. I'd be doing it organic, uh, Facebook ads. I'd be doing it organically. So the question that's coming from Jenny Braithwaite actually was, what is a realistic time scale for implementing passive income, uh, especially if you have a small audience and a new-ish business? If you um, have a zero to small audience, and it doesn't matter what your business is, because you might do a passive income that's nothing to do with your business. You, just, you don't need a website or anything. You just need an audience. Um, I'd give yourself a year. And I say that because, yes, I did it in five months and I've made that six figures from passive income in five months, but not everyone will. And I think it's really un unrealistic to think that you will do what somebody else has done. So I've had clients that have taken a year to grow their group to the right place, but now they're making money constantly every month from, from really sticking and growing it for their year. And I've had some people, had a, a great florist who after two months of growing this group, she only had 450 people in there. She's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch. And I was like, no, 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 don't launch yet. Like wait until you've got more people because the, the conversion rate could be quite low and then you won't have enough people. And she was like, no, they're really engaged. I'm going to do it. She did it. She made like 12,000 pounds the first time she, she did it. So it can work in two months. It just completely depends on how engaged you can get that audience. And how yeah. Fabulous. And that kind of answers that quite a few people have come in on the thread and, you know, asking how much time do I need? How long is it going to take to set up? But there was a separate question actually that's come in and you mentioned this earlier about different platforms. Hmm. I use uh, Thinkific for my online courses and I know you've got, uh, there's Thinkific, you've got Udemy, Teachable, Think, and, yeah, yeah. Teachable. Um, but actually one of the questions that came in was... Um, What's the question, God? It was basically asking about what would be the best platform to start on. And I know that's a really super big question because they, they're quite similar, but I guess Udemy yeah. is quite different to Thinkific and yeah. Teachable. What I would do if I was starting again is I would ask my audience where they wanted it. Because it's not about you, it's about your audience. So my audience wanted Teachable. Um, they love teachable, it's nice and easy. And now my audience, I, I've migrated a lot over to member space because it's easy for them to use and they use it for everything. So my membership GSD Society is on there, my, all of my courses are on there. So once most people that do something with me, they do two or three more things. So I've got like a lifetime value of a client. Mm. And if they're used to using one thing, it's easy for them to use it for everything else. But I'd ask your audience because all of these things, like, Ask your audience about what they want. So let's say you've grown a group, you've got 1,000 people in there. Say to them, I'm putting a course together about XXX. What do you want in it? First of all, let them tell you what to teach them. And then what platforms have you used before that you really love? Where would you want this? Some people say, can we just do it all in a Facebook group? And that's cool too. If you want to do what's best for you and your audience. But don't let the tech stop you. The tech is always the bit that people go, oh, I can't do it because I don't understand the tech. It's too, there's so many standalone programs that are really easy and front-facing these days. And also, you can pay a tech VA £25 an hour and they can do it in a few hours for you, set it all up. So there's no excuse. And especially if you're going to sell your course first or your membership and then write it, you'll have the money to get a PA on board to do all these things for you. Yeah, fabulous. Thank you. That's, that's great. And then the last question I want to ask you is you were recently featured in Forbes. Yeah. Huge. Right? And I know you've got some huge opportunities uh, off the back of that, just in, engaging, you know, engagement. Tell us about that experience. What, mm -hmm. First of all, why, how did you get into Forbes? And was that really important? Was that an important kind of kudos yeah. to be featured there? It was, I had a year ago, I had a list of, I always have a list of goals that I want to hit and I didn't hit that one. And I hit all of the others that I wanted to achieve. Um, and I didn't hit Forbes and it's really hard to get into Forbes. It's easy to get into Forbes to do your five ways to do this or like 10 tips to whatever. But I wanted an article all about me and about my journey and I wanted it to cover bullying so that I could help lots of people out there that were going through bullying. So, because I know so many people are, and I thought if I could show them that other people who they may see as successful have been there, then it will help them. So it took a while um, and it came at, at such a, a weird way. So I'm in a mastermind with Selena Sue and um, a lot of other amazing entrepreneurs and um, one of the people in the mastermind, we just clicked automatically. We became like 
really good buddies and um, she needed some help with passive income. So I was helping her with passive income. And then she was like, oh, you know, is there anything I can help you with? And I said, well, you can, she's a storyteller. She like, was really good with getting your story out. And I said, you can help me with my story because I've got all these bits to my story, like about the bullying and, and passive income. And I don't really know how to get it down to be able to pitch. So she helped me with my story. And then once I'd written the story, she was like, this, you've got a really interesting story. You should, you should put this into a publication. And I was like, well, I'd love it to go into Forbes, but you know, I don't know how to get in. She was a writer for Forbes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well. This she is woo-woo stuff, Lisa. I'm not sure we should be talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, she wrote the article for Forbes. And the, the amazing thing about it was that it trended. Um, so I have a really loyal audience. I love my audience. I, you know, I, I've been able, I've been really lucky enough to build a brilliant membership of 400 amazing women who help each other out every single day with whatever anyone needs. And I, you know, told them about it and they were like, we're going to share this for you. Let's get it trending. Let's get it on the front page of Forbes. You know, let's see if Forbes will pick it up on their social media. And I spoke to my friend, Celine, who wrote it and she said, it's quite hard to do that. Um, how many share, how many views do you think you'll get? And I was like, I reckon I can get 2000 people to look at it. And she was like, okay, you're going to need like 40 to 50,000 views to get them to pick up on it. Within the first 24 hours, we had 120,000 views. Wow. Within the first week, we had quarter of a million and they trended everywhere. So they put it on their social media. They, um, they put it on their front page. They did everything that I could possibly want it to do. And Forbes, what I love about Forbes is they're strict. So as soon as they saw it was trending, they got in touch with us and were like, we need proof of every single thing you said in that article, because if it trends, you know, it's important. Mm. So I had to like show how much I'd earned and that all the things in there were true, which is brilliant. I think that's such a good thing yeah. to do because, you know, you can't fake that stuff then. Um, so yeah, it was such a great experience for me and so many things have come out of it. And I do feel like it's a bit of an achievement because it's something I always wanted. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah, massive well done. I think that's, yeah. and I often talk about this in terms of like external validation in that I know that we shouldn't seek external validation, but it is nice to have recognition yeah. of what you've achieved. It is. And the main thing that it did for me is I got over a hundred messages from people who had read it, who were being bullied. Yeah. Said, you know, this has really helped me. I feel like if you can do it, I can do it. And that's exactly what I wanted. Um, interestingly enough, it really helped a lot of people being bullied, but that one article got me bullied online again. Really, did it? Yeah. Um, somebody saw it in a group and didn't like it and said that I'm, you know, I'm probably a con artist. And this was a person that owns a very big group of 3,000 people and has never met me. And she wrote in there, you know, I've heard negative things about this person. I would never endorse working with her. And somebody wrote to her and said, oh, do you know her then? She said, no, I've never met her. <laughs> and yet she said that in front of 3,000 people. Um, so I reached out to her and said, I'd love to have a conversation with you so that you can get to know me and then you can decide whether that's who I am or not, but nothing, obviously. Well, good, good for you. Um, <laughs> as we talked about earlier, really, it's a reflection on them as a person, not on you. And they don't even know you, right? So they, don't know you. They, they admitted that they'd never met me, never spoken to me. Yeah, it's, it, it's funny how things trigger different people in different ways. But what I've really learned is that you can't control how people react to things you do. You can only control how you react to what they do. Yeah. So that's become much easier and it's like a weight lifted when you start thinking like that. Um, you can't control them and neither should you try. Yeah, amazing. Well, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, Lisa. <laughs> how can people reach out to you? If they're hearing what you've been saying today and want to work with you, how can they reach out to you? So the best way is to go into my Facebook group, which is called The Fabulous 5%. Um, and if they just want to reach out to me to ask any questions or anything like that, I'm on Lisa at lisajohnsoncoaching.co.uk. Fabulous. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Lisa. It's been an absolute oh, thank pleasure. You. Thank thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Wow, what an incredible lady. I really hope that you took a lot 
from this particular episode and last week's episode from Lisa Johnson. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And I just love the way that she's so straight talking, tells it as it is. Um, and, you know, really interesting to hear about her personal struggles and how she's overcome those to build such a successful business. So I hope you've managed to get lots and lots of different tips from that, from these two interviews. And don't forget, if you want to grab any of those steps and tips that Lisa's given you, along with her links for her Facebook group um, and her courses, etc., then don't forget that you can jump onto the website and grab those links. Um, and they will be on both our websites, the themoneypanel.co.uk and also katherinemorgan.com. Thanks very much for listening. Speak to you next week. You've been listening to Catherine Morgan's In Her Financial Shoes podcast. If you enjoyed this show, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes. And don't forget, if you're feeling stuck and overwhelmed and want to learn more about being financially resilient, confident and in control, head over to www.catherinemorgan.com. Listener.